So this has been kind of a you know one of those years. We got a lot of flooding up in the Northeast. This is causing a lot of temporary economic damage. Likely going to see some more flooding. You know, of course, New Orleans just recently because of the hurricane. You know, these economic impacts. You know, they drive economic activity in the short term. So again. One thing that we're kind of watching here very carefully is you get this collusion of events going on, right? So first thing we have is we have these supply chain disruptions, and then you get an increased demand for goods, products, or services because of natural disasters, right? So that leads to an extension of, and again, this is what the Fed's been thinking, is that, well, in the near term, these inflationary pressures are transient. Well, yeah, that was the case until you started getting some of these actions that create more demand in the near term, right? So now we've got this issue where we're going to have a lot of demand for economic rebuilding. That's products, that's goods, that's services, stuff that's got to be shipped. Right now, it's costing the equivalent of 68 brand new Ferraris to rent a container ship for three months. This is problematic, right? These are these costs that are not getting pass through just yet fully to the consumer. If we take a look at PPI last week, that's the producer price index. So that's the, the cost that producers are having to pay in order to manufacture products. It had a huge spike. And now the deviation between PPI and CPI, which is the consumer price index, now the largest on record. Now what that means is, is that producers are not able to pass on these costs. And now the Fed is getting into a really tough spot here. Uh, um, Nick Timmeros from the Wall Street Journal inclimating on Friday in the Wall Street Journal that the Fed will announce taper starting in November and moving into next year and ending in 2022. So this is going to be problematic because now inflation's coming up. Inflation doesn't seem to be as transient as the Fed had hoped because now you have these extra events that are coming on that are creating more demand that's extending that problem of shortages and higher prices. Now, the problem, of course, is that the market is very tied to liquidity. In fact, over the last decade, there's been a higher correlation between liquidity flows into the markets, primarily the Fed, and, um, and the markets. And what we've seen previously, the linkage was more between economic activity and the market. So again, this, this liquidity flow from the Fed has been very important in pushing asset prices higher here over the last decade in particular, but particularly since the lows of 2020. So now with the Fed being kind of pushed into the corner because of these inflationary pressures, having to reduce that liquidity, this is going to potentially put more pressure on stocks going into 2022. Now, there's a couple of implications of that as well. If you take a look at the recent poll ratings of Joe Biden's performance, those have been dropping sharply. Now, why is that important, right? Because we've got midterms right around the corner. Now, one of the big hopes was is that in the next, by the end of September, that the Democrats are going to be able to pass this $3.5 trillion spending bill, get a lot of money into the hands of individuals, hopefully buy some votes for the midterms next year. That now looks to get, be getting held up by Joe Manchin again over the weekend on several talk shows saying he's not going to support a $3.5 trillion spending plan at this juncture. There's already a lot of liquidity in the markets. There's already been a lot of support. And his point is, is that, hey, let's, let's evaluate where we are. Let's think this through logically. Let's just not go do stuff just because we can do it. That's going to put a little bit of a damper on potentially getting that passed. You've got the budget ceiling problem coming up for the Treasury. They've got problems. They need more liquidity here. So you've got to get a budget resolution passed. If they pass, and they, now here's the trick. If they pass a budget resolution to fund the government without the $3.5 trillion in the bill, they can't come back and use reconciliation. That bill would then have to go through the normal voting process requiring 60 votes, which means the Democrats can't get it done. So this is a real problem for the Democrats, particularly heading into, again, midterms next year. And then, unfortunately, you've already got that weighing on you coming up for midterms. Then you get a market correction potentially next year, a large pickup in volatility because of reduced reduce liquidity. That weighs on consumer confidence even more, and that shows up in voting at the polls as well. So again, Democrats have quite a few problems here over the course of the next several months trying to get their agenda done. At the same time, the Fed is now going to be forced to pull liquidity from the market. So this is going to really provide some challenges, both politically, economically, it's going to be a problem. Financially, this is potentially going to be a problem. Again, 
uh, the markets have been so elevated for so long here, very low levels of complacency. This is the risk we're looking for over the next few months. That could, that could provide a bit more structure to the markets. We've written an article previously talking about ESG investing. Now, this is that thesis that we should invest in companies that are environmentally, socially, and governance conscious. That sounds great, right? Sounds great. Problem is, as we've talked about, is that there's absolutely no guidelines as to what ESG actually is. And so it's great. We've got you know, this idea that we're going to be investing in environmentally, socially, and governance conscious companies, but we really have no idea what they are. And, and what we have to rely on is Wall Street to tell us which companies are ESG responsible or not. So the, the easy way to define this is that all oil companies are bad. Everybody else is fine. <laughs> so th this is how we get to the conclusion of what's ESG. But here's the, here's the bigger story is that Wall Street really doesn't have any guidelines for what ESG is. It's more of just a political shift to help support the social narrative in the economy. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. If you want to do it, it's completely good. But as investors, we should be understanding what we're investing in because ultimately our job is to make sure our money's growing over time. And, you know, we want to try to make investment choices that are going to lead to the best return on investment, right? Makes complete sense. You know, there's, and again, we've talked about this before, is that back in the late 90s, it was all about sin stocks. We had a very similar move back then. It was like, okay, we're not going to invest in sin stocks. No gambling, no alcohol, no, no um, pornography, anything like that. And so we all made a move that we weren't going to do this. And, of course, those stocks like Philip Morris and other companies, those sin stocks, went on to do fabulously well. In fact, they were doing so well that investors went, well, I think I'll invest in – I think I'll start investing in some sin stocks because they're doing really well here. And, again, at the end of the day, it sounds great that you're going to invest in these socially environmentally conscious things, but – when performance begins to really outshine other areas of the markets, people tend to overcome those virtues in exchange for the greed of making money. That's the way it always occurs. So again, we're doing this ESG thing, and right now it's working great. And we've talked about this before. The problem is that you really have no idea what you're investing in, and pretty much all you're investing in is the S&P 500. And apparently <laughs> all ESG companies are uh, in the S&P 500. Um, you know, we, we talked about the fact that what companies are doing right now, and there's an article out this morning, it's from the Wall Street Journal, saying that all companies are doing is they say, oh, I've got this, uh, this uh, you, know, in, you know, it's large cap growth fund or whatever this fund is that I'm, that I'm running, and I'm not getting a lot of inflows into it. You know, it's not really performing all that great or whatever it is. So I need something to generate some excitement. So what they do is, is they just rename it. Instead of saying it's the Brent Clanton Large Cap Growth Fund, it's the Brent Clanton ESG Fund. And then all of a sudden, people start throwing money into it because it's ESG. Now, did they change any of the holdings? No. But what they did do was raise the fee by two times. So you're paying more for the same amount of, of fund, right? You didn't get anything different. You got the exact same fund. You're just paying twice as much for it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, going to the store and you, and you buy a bag of chips. They now cost you $2 versus a dollar and there's half as many chips in the bag, but it's the same chip, right? I mean, nothing changed. It's just inflation of fees. But this is this whole idea of Wall Street marking a narrative. And the narrative is great. And no wonder, you know, uh, when you take a look at BlackRock, Larry Fink, of course, who's the head of BlackRock, he runs around chanting ESG at every corner of, of the company. Of course, this is a $9 trillion fund uh, that basically has, you know, added a trillion dollars in, in assets under the last year, right? So, and, they're, they're, and they, are, they are culpable. You take a look at the BlackRock funds, ESG funds, there's two things to notice. The first is, is that the top 10 hold, actually there's three things to notice. The top 10 holdings are virtually the same as the S&P 500. The performance is identical to the S&P 500. So you're getting nothing 
in exchange for buying the ESG fund. You're not getting anything in terms of performance. You're paying twice as much for it. But ironically, in the top 10 holdings is BlackRock. So think about that for a second. I'm telling you that you need to buy an ESG fund and my company is in the top 10 holdings of that fund I'm selling you. So now I'm charging you twice as much and you're helping prop up the price of my company by buying my fund that has my stock, my corporate stock inside the fund. So seems to be a little bit of a conflict of interest, but hey, nobody's talking about that right now. But the American, this is from the Wall Street Journal, the American Century Fundamental Equity Fund is now the Sustainable Equity Fund. Fund. The USA World Growth Fund is now the USAA Sustainable World Fund. And the Putnam Multi-Cap Growth Fund is now the Putnam Sustainable Leaders Fund. You have big fund companies with an inventory of funds, a lot of which aren't really attracting any assets anymore because people are buying you know, Bitcoin and other stuff. So they're saying, okay, here's the new investment trend happening. Let's just change the name of the fund. And guess what? All of a sudden, people start throwing money into it. 35 of 64 rebranded funds since 2013 were suffering from investor withdrawals in the three years before they went, quote unquote, green. Once the rebranding was complete, 13 funds saw investors put cash back into the funds. So here at RA Advisors, we are now solely ESG responsible. Please send us your check. Didn't see that coming. (laughs) Didn't see that coming at all. Oh, and our fees are being doubled, by the way. So we are we will be increasing our fees on asset management, but we are we are solely focused on ESG now. So just you know, give me a call and we'll get your account set up, get you get you going right away. It's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous at the end of the day. But but this is the, this is what. But there's a couple of things about this note. First of all, this is very much a sign of a bubble is that when investors are simply just chasing assets because they're trying to find the next hot ticket. And right now, Wall Street's telling everybody that ESG is the next hot ticket. And it's working, right? Because I tell you, I'm Wall Street, so I tell you, hey, you've got to invest in ESG funds. So you go, okay, well, Wall Street tells me i got to invest in ESG funds. So you do that, which drives up the price of the fund, which... As the price of the fund goes up, you go, hey, that was a smart investment. Let me put more money into it. That attracts more people. That pushes the prices up even more. So creating these mantras, right, like this is part of the bubble. This is because investors are just investing in anything at this point without really paying attention to what they're investing to because everything's a no-lose situation. NFTs, $2.5 trillion, uh, $2.5 billion of you know, ESG transactions just over the last you know, few months. So we've got people piling into NFTs. Most people don't know what they are, but people are piling into them anyway. You know, cryptocurrencies, nothing wrong with them. But hey, just another kind of part of that analogy of the markets, right? And then you've got stocks. We have more stocks in the S&P 500 trading above 10 and 20 times price of sales than ever before in history. Ever. Of course, this is all just a function of liquidity. But the, the important thing about all this is that These are the things to pay attention to because when there is a reversal, whenever that is, and maybe we'll never have a reversal ever again, if you want to believe that. These are the things that get hit the hardest. So you got to really kind of, you know, look, the, the basic premise of investing is to understand what you're investing in. And let me ask you a question about this. How can you invest in environmentally, socially, government governance conscious companies if there's no parameters for what ESG actually is. I mean, if I was talking about an environmentally, socially, and governance conscious company, I wouldn't buy Apple. They manufacture their stuff in China. They've got they pay sub-minimum wages in China for the production of their products. People jumping out of the buildings to commit suicide because they work so long of hours. That's hardly considered socially or governance conscious. But Apple is the number one holding in almost every ESG fund. Why? Because the price is going up. Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google. Are these really environmentally, socially, and governance conscious companies? Particularly 
if those companies are violating the very basic rights of the Constitution. I mean, you have to even think about that from the, from the social side, right? Are these really issues? But that's the problem. See, there's, there's no guidelines for what ESG actually is, so you can make it whatever you want to be. But basically all people are doing is saying, look, let's take the top 10 holdings of the S&P 500, put them into a fund, call it the ESG fund. People will throw money into it because prices are going up. And that's why we've got this massive deviation between the mega cap companies in the S&P and every other stock in the S&P in terms of performance. So, I mean, th these are just things to think about. But this is what happens during market meltups and periods of, of bubble type activity in markets. And this is why, look, even the Fed has come around now to, to start to say, hey, you know, we're a little worried about valuations. Really? You've got more companies than ever in the index trading at 10, 30, 20, and 30 times price to sales. Yeah, it's probably a good idea that you might be a little bit worried about valuations. But this is their problem, right? They've got inflation, they've got economic growth is slowing, and now you've got a valuation multiple in the markets that is hard to justify, and now you're going to start taking away liquidity. It's a bad brew. The question is just whether or not investors will actually overlook it and keep chasing markets anyway. Historically, the answer has been no, but sure, why not? This time could be different. You know, investors will buy anything that Wall Street tells them. And it's and this is what Wall Street does well, is that when there's a trend, Wall Street will create a product to capitalize on it. And again, like I said earlier, it's like, you know, we're going to, you know, our advisors, now the ESG advisors, right? We're going to we're going to do that now because that's the hot trend, right? So we'll, you know, theoretically, we'll get billions of dollars raked into the door and we'll all be good. I don't have to invest any differently, as we were talking about. I just buy the same stuff. I just rebrand it. Sounds like a genius, genius idea. It's kind of like taking, uh, <laughs> kind of like taking the '69 Barracuda and calling it an electric vehicle, right? It's, ooh, <laughs> right. Just rebrand it. It's all good. Um, it's got a battery in it. It does have a battery. Yeah. In it. it does. But th this is the thing that. Again, we just have to think about it. And again, we go back to talking about where we are in the markets. And if you take a look here recently, more and more of the big Wall Street firms are starting to warn about a correction. Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank have all come out and said, hey, you know, might want to be a little bit more defensive here. It's been a very long time since we've had a 10% correction. And again, if you just think about last week, you had five days of a market slide and, and headlines this morning on CNBC. Can can stocks rally after five days of a slide? We were down 1.6%, 1.7% last week. 1.7% last week. In total, for five days of a slide. There's a bloodbath, I tell you. But now the, now the issue is, is of course, is if you thought that was bad, if you thought 1.7% hurt your feelings, wait till you get a 10% correction. And look, 10% corrections are common. If you take a look at the history of market returns in every year, you find returns of five or negative drawdowns. I'm sorry. Take a look at any given year. You'll find drawdowns of five to 10 to 15 to 20% almost every year. And here's what's interesting. In years where you have less than 10% drawdown, so particularly in a year where you go like, say, 2017, where you have a 2.8% drawdown maximum, the next year you typically see 9 10% drawdowns. In other words, volatility picks up. And the year after a very small level of volatility, the following year, almost without exception, has a much higher level of volatility. So you're getting these major Wall Street firms coming out talking about, you know, a potential for a correction. This is something that we've kind of been discussing here for a while. Look, markets have been very quiet this year, very low volatility. It's It's been boring. Every week in the newsletter, we write a, a client update for our clients. And, you know, when we send that out, it's like, yep, same story as last week. Nothing to do here. Very boring market. It just grinds itself higher. You have these little corrections, but... 
nothing to change. So the only thing that we can do to help manage risk is just kind of work around the fringes a little bit, right? So we add a little bit to the duration in our bond portfolio. We raise a little bit of cash. We rebalance risk in the portfolio, make some changes to lower what we call beta volatility relative to the S&P. So if the S&P falls by 1%, we're down half a percent, whatever it is. Those are the things that you can do. Those are actions you can take right now because, you know, the, the, there's, there's two risks with the markets. The first is, is that we can be overly defensive and we can say, well, this market's going to correct. Yes, it's going to correct at some point. The question is when? And here's the problem with trying to anticipate a correction to the degree that you go, I'm just going to go all into cash. And then when the market corrects, I'll, I'll put my money back to work. Well, the problem is, is that you could go to cash, say, at the beginning of this year because markets were overvalued. And here you are in September waiting for a correction. So if the market corrects by 20%, you're back to where you were at the beginning of the year. So you gave up gains by waiting for a correction to occur. So we can't really do that because we need to make gains every year in order to meet our financial goals. This is an article that I started writing yesterday talking about the importance of, of avoiding drawdowns, but the importance of also not missing rallies because we've got to make money. We've just got to make sure and try to manage that downside risk as much as possible. So we have to participate in markets while they're rising, but understand that there's risk. Let me put it in a more simplistic term. You know that every day that you go drive your car, there is a chance you are going to get into a wreck on the freeway. Could be life-threatening. So you have a choice. You can either drive carefully, wear your seatbelt, pay attention to the rules, don't speed, pay attention to traffic. And you can lower your risk of being in a life-threatening accident, or you can just not drive at all. Thanks to the pandemic, we don't have to drive at all anymore. <laughs> you know what's amazing? Even though we were locked down last year, we had more auto accidents, fatalities, than we had in the previous year. Really? 36,900 auto fatalities in 2020, despite the fact everybody was supposed to be at home locked down. How did that happen? I don't know. But, well, because there was nobody on the road, so everybody was driving faster, <laughs> right? <laughs> Drive like bats out of hell. Exactly. So when you get in a, when you get in a wreck, odds are you're going to get killed. And then when they came back to work... Everybody had forgotten how to drive. Exactly. So maybe we should take everybody's cars away, right? In order to drive. There's a mandate for that. You, you need a mandate to drive. Yes. I, 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 I digress. Anyway, point is, is that you've got the choice of driving, right? It's same thing with the financial markets. You've, you've got a choice of being invested, and you can do it somewhat more safely, what do you give up for that? Well, maybe you don't get to your destination as fast as the guy that was speeding in the left-hand lane. But you get there safely more often than not. And that's really kind of the goal here of investing. But this is the challenge. And, and see, this is the, the mistake that investors make is they go, well, the market's overvalued here. It's going to crash, so I'm just going to wait. We've got people coming to us to invest in our ESG fund right now. <laughs> wink, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> that are telling us, hey, you know, I've been out of the market since 2009. I need to get back in now. You've missed a 300% gain in the market. That's years of growth of your capital for retirement that has been lost. And the point, the important point of this conversation is, is that missing drawdowns are important, but missing gains, and again, I'm not, ch I'm not talking about chasing gains. I'm just talking about being completely out of the market and 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 missing the market upside. Missing gains in the market is just as devastating to your long-term financial success as missing the drawdowns. And we've got to balance this. 
we can't just assume that the, when the market corrects, it's going to correct back to where we are. And that's fine. But again, we've missed the gains in between. But our job is to invest. And yes, when we get into a real correction in the markets, you're going you're gonna to lose a little bit of money. But if you manage your risk right, your drawdown is going to be, you know, market's going to be down 30. You're going to be down five, six, seven. That's very easy to recover when the market bounces than trying to recover all 30%. And this is even more important to avoid drawdowns to the full degree when you're in the withdrawal stage of your financial plan. Because if the market's down 10 and I'm withdrawing, and just easy math, if I'm withdrawing 10% of my portfolio every year to live on, I wouldn't do that, but get the point. Market's down 10, I take out 10, I'm down like 21. Because as I'm taking out capital, I'm accelerating the drawdown because I'm selling into a declining market in order to extract capital to live on. So drawdowns during the retirement phase is even more critical to avoid than it is during the growth phase when you're saving money. And a lot of investors are way too cavalier about drawdowns. They're like, ah, pfft, get a bit of a drawdown. So what? There is a huge difference between average gains and actual gains. I can average 7% return over the course of 10 years. But if I spent five years just getting back to even, my actual return won't be 7%. Be right back after the break. So uh, Democrats right now scrambling to adjust their tax hikes after Senator Joe Manchin said he wouldn't support uh, the $3.5 trillion spending package in its current form. And so they started working on a change to the tax structure, how they're going to pay for this, this $3.5 trillion in spending. New proposal would raise the corporate tax rate from 21 to 26.5%. Capital gains would rise from 20 to 25%, and that was instead of the 39.6% that Biden wanted. Um. And, and they call this the uh, the new set of business minded tax increases. Now, here's here's the thing about taxes. We're always running around and we're we're trying to increase tax rates on. We we want the rich to pay more, right? They just don't pay enough. They pay ninety percent of all the taxes. They need to pay all of them. But we want them to pay more, so we're going to all raise tax rates. You don't need to raise tax rates. You need you need to lower tax rates. If you want, if you want the rich, now follow me through for a second. If you want the rich to pay more, lower tax rates. Lower it to 10%. If you lower tax rates to 10%, you would collect more in tax than you will collect in tax at 39.6%, with this exception. You lower the tax rate to 10%, but you get rid of all the deductions, the loopholes, the write-offs. You just basically scrap your tax code and say everybody pays 10% of their income, period. So whatever your income is, when it gets reported to the bottom line, that's what it is. No deductions, no write-offs, no nothing. Now, there's a lot of consequences to that. You're going to destroy charities if you do that. And we depend a lot on charities. Charitable contributions are very important to keeping our charities at work, from St. Jude's to a, a, a massive numbers of others, United Way, etc. They do great work. They depend on charitable tax-deducted donations to fund those operations, and they do important work. So I understand that there's caveats to this, but my point is simply this, is that we're always running around trying to get the rich to pay more, and we just keep playing with the tax rate, but but the tax rate doesn't matter because you can charge me 80%. If you leave all the tax loopholes and write-offs and everything else in the tax code, these companies are still going to get by without paying any taxes because they have a whole bevy of tax lawyers sitting around in their boardrooms going, 
well, we need to do this and we need to do that and we need to change the way we categorize this and that to take advantage of this tax credit loophole, whatever it is, and reduce our taxable income. So, but this is the, this is the idiocy of all this and, and changing tax codes and all that stuff, it doesn't ever increase the amount of tax revenue. We don't collect more. In fact, if you take a look at what's been going on with tax revenue, it rises basically with the, the level of economic growth, which you would expect. People, are, No matter what you do with tax rates, people pay about the same amount of tax. It's just incrementally growing because the economy is growing. But we're spending way more. So even though we're going to raise with these new taxes, and this is this is also the kind of the, the funny part of all this, we're gonna we're gonna institute these new higher taxes, and that's gonna raise an additional two trillion dollars in taxes. No, it doesn't. It never does. And that's over 10 years, mind you. So over 10 years, we'll raise an extra 200 billion dollars a year over 10 years. But we're gonna spend three and a half trillion. Do the math. That doesn't really work out very well. And that's just on one bill. That doesn't include all the other spending that we've got to do, the mandatory spending for Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, prescription drug benefits, defense spending, education, interest on the debt. That's all got to be funded, too, and none of that's included in that $3.5 trillion. So the tax changes aren't even going to cover the new spending, much less all the required spending that we already have to do, which means we just go further and further and further into debt. And again, look, who cares, right? $3 trillion deficit, $4 trillion deficit, $10 trillion deficit doesn't seem to matter. I'm writing an article right now talking about this very issue because the general attitude is, as well, we're running a $4 trillion deficit, and not, look, everything's going just fine. We're completely good. Look at Japan. They're 280% of debt to GDP. They're still, they, they haven't gone into the dark ages yet. No, they haven't. But if you take a look at their economy, it's not certainly one that you want to be a young person in. Kids can't leave the home because they can't find work to support themselves. It's not great. Birth rates in the U.S. are falling because kids are having a tough time getting well-paying jobs that they can feel comfortable into getting into relationships and starting a family with because of the cost. So more and more millennials are living at home with parents. That's a generational change. We have more millennials living home with parents now than since we had kids living with parents in, in World War II. So, you know, we're clearly not headed in the right direction, but because the whole world hasn't blown up yet, then running massive deficits really doesn't seem to matter. Yet. But see, this is always the problem. It doesn't matter now. And this is the, the, the problem with the attitude that we take towards these issues as our elected officials. Is that, well, it hasn't hurt us Yet, so, you know, we can keep doing this. Well, the problem is always becomes the case is that when it does become a problem, it's too late. And, and, and this is, as we've always said before, is that we have a choice as voters, as citizens, and as government officials. We have a choice. We can take action now that may be a little painful and start slowly resolving some of these issues and we can do it on a time frame that we can absorb and make it as least painful as possible. Or we can wait until those choices are forced upon us. You know, it's much like people with their health. Eat a little bit better, as you know, as our good friend Keith Klein used to say in our show when we used to do a regular segment with him. He'd say, make better bad choices. In other words... Do little things today that will add up over time to better health. Make better bad choices. In other words, if you're going to eat a burger, eat a burger with no cheese and no mayonnaise. Right? Just try to reduce the calorie count somewhat. You're still making a bad choice by eating a burger, but you can make better bad choices. You can reduce the calorie count by some. 
you can make some improvements and you add those improvements up over time and things work. So we have that ability to make better bad choices, but we're not, we're making worse choices <laughs> as we go forward because there's not been a consequence. And very much like health, we have that idea. We can say, well, you know, I've been eating this way for years. Sure. I'm, you know, an extra hundred pounds overweight. I smoke, I drink, etc. cetera, but pff, nothing's ever happened to me yet. Then you have a heart attack, quadruple bypass. And then the doctor says, hey, if you don't start doing these things, you're going to die. That's how the economy works. You have a choice. You can start making some of these choices now, exercise, eat better, drink water, etc., and slowly get yourself back into shape rather than having to do it all at once. And that's the way the economy works. Eventually, the economy says, eh, you're done. And those choices are made for you. And how are those choices made for you? Well, you get a spike in interest rates because nobody wants your debt. You have massive inflation, whatever it is. There is a consequence that will come about economically that will start to solve your problems for you. Social Security is a good example of this. We just Every year we get the Social Security Board of Trustees report. We wrote about this last week. Talk about the insecurity of Social Security. Every year we get the report out that says, hey, by 2034, 2035, 2033, wherever it is, we're going to have to start cutting pension benefits for Social Security uh, individuals. And we all go, well, pff, you better not cut mine. But see, instead of making some decisions right now that we could do, we could say, look, okay, for everybody over the age of X, no benefit cuts. For everybody under the age of X, those, those contributions are going to go up by X amount, and we're going to cut future benefits by Y amount, and we're going to do you know, X or Z going forward to solve this other problem. And you can slowly work yourself into making Social Security and Medicare and the social welfare net more long-lasting. You still might not solve the problem, but you can make it last longer until you can work yourself into a better financial position. But we don't want to do that because everybody says, well, you better not touch my Social Security. I contributed to it for all these years. Yeah, you did. You're supporting everybody else that's drawing into it. It's not your money. This is the thing that we tend to forget is that we're paying Social Security – for the welfare of other people. That's not your money. Your money is with the guy that's coming up behind you, those millennials and Gen Zers that are coming up. They're the ones paying your Social Security. They're paying to support you. 1940s, we had 16 people paying into the system for everybody drawing out. We have 2.1 people paying in for every person taken out. Now, math simply doesn't work. So we have choices. Taxes are a function of choices. They don't solve the problem of spending, which is also a choice. But we continue to make bad choices because it appeases what we think is, in a way, appeases the voters. Wraps up the show for the day. Be back on the website now. What's wrong with gold? That is our new article out this morning. What's wrong with gold? Absolutely nothing. Nothing's wrong with it. We have an article on it this morning on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Also, make sure and hang around. Our daily market commentary will be coming out at 7.30 this morning. Make sure you're subscribed to the website. Just simply go to the website, click on the box that says subscribe now. Be delivered right to your inbox every morning before the market opens. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Have a great day. See you back here tomorrow. It's a rich man's world.